Welcome to this edition of Security and Compliance Weekly. We have a very special show planned today as we are joined by Mr. Errol Weiss. He is the Chief Security Officer for the, let me take a breath, Health Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or H-ISAC for short. Errol is here today to enlighten us on all things ISAC related from the evolution and state of information sharing, the origin story of ISACs, the role of information sharing for both cybersecurity and compliance programs, and what's the best way to engage these organizations. Of course, we'll also hear a little bit about Errol's backstory, how he got into the business, but we do want to spend uh, the bulk of the time talking about ISACs. So join us as we continue our journey of tearing down silos and building bridges on Security and Compliance Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. And now, it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security. Your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. Welcome to episode 68 of Security and Compliance Weekly, recorded on April 6th, 2021. I'm your host, Mr. Jeff Mann, and with me today are my fantastic co-hosts, Ms. Kat Valentine, Mr. Josh Marpet, and Mr. Scott Lyons. Greetings, going on, little compadres. You want to go ahead and get the uh, shot of Scott out, out of the way for us? Uh, yeah, I, I can. Uh, yesterday, uh, for those of you who may or may not know, uh, we actually suffered a, a pretty a pretty big loss in the uh, in the hacker community. Uh, one of our one of our esteemed uh, compadres uh, passed away, uh, uh, and you know if we could. I'll just take a moment of silence. That would be great. Sure. All right. Thanks, Scott, and and cheers to the, to those that are grieving. Mm-hmm. Hey, if you have any specific guest or uh, topic suggestions that you want to share with us. For this or any of our shows, you can submit these suggestions by going to our website, securityweekly.com forward slash guests, and completing the form. We review those suggestions on the regular, and we'll reach out to you if we're interested in taking you up on the idea. All right. It is an extreme pleasure for me to introduce today's guest, Mr. Errol Weiss. As I mentioned, he is the Chief Security Officer for the Health ISAC. Errol's been in that position for about two years, and prior to that, uh, he spent uh, 12, 13 years in, let's say, financial services. He's worked for a couple of different banks that you've heard of. Um, I'd rather let him you know, give you the backstory uh, about how he got his start in cybersecurity. So, Ari, Errol, welcome to Security and Compliance Weekly. Jeff, I've been dying for this moment to be with you for so long, so this is great. I'm really thrilled to be here with you. And the rest of the uh, panel. <laughs> I, I am uh, more than excited to have you. And uh, you know, so let me just ask this innocuous question. How'd you get your start in cybersecurity? How about that? It might have been sitting literally right next to you um, <laughs> many, many years ago. Uh, that may be another story. But uh, I did do, uh, I, I found my way to the uh, penetration testing team during my days at the National Security Agency. And uh, and that's that's where that's where it all started. So uh, so so yeah, Jeff and I might have crossed paths back then. I I did that for a few years. I left the government, was doing it for uh, private sector consulting companies for a number of years, and then eventually, uh, well, I was at uh, uh, SAIC at the time when the notion of of an ISAC was starting to come together, and I found myself on the team that was creating the first one. So you can get that in into that a little bit later but that was uh, that was how i got started and all many many years ago never could plot that journey out if i tried mm. yeah so full disclosure to my co-host and the listening audience if you can put two and two together errol <laughs> and i were both both in the organization that became known uh, in in the lore of history as the pit so uh, Errol is uh, one of the other founding members in fact one of the i, I would say 
even chief architect of the pit from the early early days of what we were just calling, hey, let's just start breaking into things and learn how all this hacking stuff works. Um, he actually left uh, NSA about a year before I did and, and left me yep. holding the bag, which is, uh, you know, didn't take me long to get in trouble. But like you said, that's a, another story for another day. I do uh, have from my archive, um, uh, Errol went out into the private sector and, and doing ethical hacking and, and, and security testing was literally a new thing. All we, all we knew about was how Robert Redford had done it in the movie Sneakers, almost quite literally. But, uh, Johnny, if you can put up that shot, uh, I, I actually have a picture of Errol from, I think, about uh, 1996. Uh, He's there, on a, yeah. there it is. Uh, a little bit of hair left. Uh, Little bit of hair and really curious as to the, the role of the wooden beam in in your uh, penetration testing methodology back in the day. <laughs> yeah, I think it was to hold up the uh, the keyboard or something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> I great. promised yeah, you yeah, a few surprises. Our... That's one of yeah, them. Yeah, that's good. That's a good one. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll save most of those stories, uh, uh, about the, well, one more story, I guess. And then we'll jump into the discussion of the ISACs. Uh, when we first started breaking into computers, one of, one of the members of the pit, he had stayed late one night and was playing with some newfangled technology that allowed you to record audio. So we came in the next morning and, uh, Johnny, if you can give us sound clip number one, this is what we heard. Roll. You're a bad boy. <laughs> and Good of one. course, I I can give you mine as well. The uh, the other one I have is for a, a player to be named later. So go ahead and roll clip number two. Man, the man is on your machine. <laughs> the oh man, gosh. the man is on your machine. Good time. Uh, that just you know, it just <laughs> reminds me of you know. Nothing worse than being on a pen test team and walking away from your keyboard without locking your screen for five minutes <laughs> and coming back and finding out, you know, it's probably one of those recordings playing on your machine because you've just been taking, out, yep. taking over. Yeah, great times. <laughs> oh, and your screen upside down and your keyboard switched to like Azerbaijani and, you yeah. know, it, it's always fun. I've been there. Or or your or your uh, slash login script having log out written into it <laughs> and trying to trying to figure out how to get past that. How do you Good stop times. That executing? Um, yep. I will I will give you uh, 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 guys a quick tease. We're, we are trying to put together a pit reunion uh, interview show segment for probably for Paul Security Weekly, hopefully sometime shortly after the world opens up again. So stay tuned for that. But enough of that. Let's talk about ISACs. I've, I've known about ISACs, it seems like, forever. And in putting the, the show together today, it's probably I know about it because I, I know you. <laughs> and... Um, it occurred to me at some point that, you know, like people I work with, my day job, uh, you know, the hundreds of shows that I've been on, on on Paul Security Weekly and now Security and Compliance Weekly, I don't think I've ever heard anybody or very rarely have heard anybody mention uh, any of the ISACs. So, uh, you know, one of my questions ultimately, Errol, is going to be, why is that? Uh, but I would remiss if I didn't start this thing off with asking you what we like to call the hot seat question, just sort of level set. Uh, we ask all of our, our guests, uh, because this is a show about security and compliance and trying to marry those two concepts and worlds together. Where do you fall on what we like to call the security versus compliance continuum? Yeah, so my answer to that one is, you know, you have to do both. But I will tell you, again, one of my stories from our days back in the NSA doing penetration testing, my classic quote, we were, we were doing an outbrief from a pen test. We had just been all over their systems, rooted all over the place. We were, we were you know, cruising through everything and just had taken over what we did. And again, this is on a military base, military systems. And we were going through the debrief, telling them what we did, how we did it, the fact that we were all through their systems. And they, they, their lead basically said, you know, how could this be? We just got our certification compliance checklist done last week. <laughs> right. So, um, so I think the danger is that you don't want to just have people think that I can just go through compliance and everything's going to be great. You know, I think it's important. It's a great 
part of the overall security posture, but it's not everything. And so that's that's my caution regarding compliance. Okay. Fair enough. And, uh, you know, we, we might come back. That might come up in conversation today. We'll see how it turns out. Um, I mean, where where do you want to start, ISACs? Uh, start with what your the heck is start an with the origins. <laughs> or, you know, what is an ISAC? Yeah, what, what the, the heck, heck is an ISAC? <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's not the, the household name that we w- hope it would be 21 plus years later after it was created. Wow. Really old. Um, so what is it? So, so uh, as Jeff said so eloquently during the opening, information sharing and analysis center. The whole concept started, I would say, probably in the early to mid 1990s, when the U.S. Uh, federal government realized that the that the um, that 85 percent of the critical infrastructure was owned and operated by the private sector. And looking at how to try to protect that critical infrastructure, knowing what catastrophic events could follow, if there were damage and harm there, uh, looking to protect that, they came up with the idea of the ISAC to encourage the private sector to take an active role in protecting the security of the infrastructure that these these private sector organizations were running. And so it really started out, you know, with, like I said, with uh, what Jeff said, maybe earlier, with the Financial Services ISAC being the first one out of the gate in October of 1999. Um, it really started out back in that time as, as being a way to share cyber threat information and incident information with each other in a secure forum. And um, it's since evolved since that time, you know, roll ahead to September 11. 2001, where resilience really started to become an issue, right? You look at what happened after 9-11, the stock market being down for over a week. Um, you know, when, when they were planning backup sites in New York, nobody was thinking that the entirety of lower Manhattan could become a, a problem site. And I remember people joking about think, pre-9-11 saying like, hey, if all of lower Manhattan were out, we'd have bigger problems. Well, I think nobody really counted on something that catastrophic happening. So mm-hmm. after 9-11, physical security, resilience, cybersecurity all became really important to them. And, and just to sum it up, I'll, and I'll stop, is you know, thinking about ISACs really being kind of a, a virtual neighborhood watch program. If you see someone that's rolling around your house, peering through windows in the backyard, it's probably not a great thing. You probably want to let your neighbors know about somebody. Maybe you can give a description of the individual. If somebody breaks in your house, maybe you can share with uh, people about how that individual or people may have done that so that other houses, other homeowners can protect themselves better. And that's really the whole notion of the ISAC. So it's really um, evolved quite a bit. So not just sharing incident information, but even sharing best practices today. Well, I remember from the you know the early days, uh, my earliest memories of talking about ISACs and and you know hanging out with you and finding out what you know what's going on you know whatever the conversation was, uh, you know early on there seemed to be a real reticence for organizations, especially organizations within industry verticals, uh, uh, aka the competition. Uh, you know, sharing, you know, that type of information. It, it seemed like that was a huge hurdle back then. Uh, I'm curious, is, is that still a hurdle today or, or, or have, have the collective we gotten over that? Yeah, I think there's, there's some ways to go yet. We can talk a bit about that um, as we get further into the show here today. But, you know, and it also varies from one sector to another. And I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention also is that um, when, when the government defined critical infrastructure, there were 16 different critical infrastructures, everything from transportation, banking, finance, healthcare, um, energy, water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can go look them all up. Uh, they all have an, an ISAC or multiple ISACs that may be serving each of those communities, depending on who they are. And uh, some of the links I share with Jeff uh, that are available to everybody here, you can go find out all of these different ISACs. So one of my plugs during the show is going to be, hey, whatever infrastructure, whatever critical infrastructure you're in, 
go seek out your ISAC and, and try to figure out how to belong to that because I think that there's benefit to it. Um, and so, you know, the sharing does differ from, from sector to sector from what I've seen. But I will tell you, you know, being involved in the banking, finance, the financial services, ISAC from the beginning, I saw the migration, what happened in, in sharing from the beginning. And it was a pretty concerted effort in the beginning to make sure that it was just the banks, no government organizations were allowed to belong in the beginning. And that has since, since changed. But I would also say that things like the traffic light protocol, we can talk about that a bit, but it's basically an information sharing um, marking mechanism that allows the creator to tag information so that the receiver knows what they can do with it. How broadly can they share that information? And between things like the traffic light protocol and automated indicator sharing, those new inventions really help the spirit and, and ability of individuals and organizations to share tremendously um, starting probably around 2006, 2007, and where it really just exploded. And just as an example, I can tell you within Health ISAC, uh, member sharing, we had over 100,000 indicators ever shared last year from member to member uh, sharing of what's happening within the Health ISAC. So it varies, it could always improve, and we're always working on ways to help uh, ensure that the information that people share is being um, protected. I don't want to bogart the, the mic co-hosts. Anybody else want to jump in with questions? I got lots of questions, but <laughs> anybody else want to jump in here? Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned that, uh, Gupper, that at first governments weren't really involved in this, but they are now, right? Like, is yeah, this... Yeah, it's... Uh, um, sorry, Kat. No, it's okay. Um, no, I was just going to say, um, at, you know, at first in the 90s, governments were not involved, uh, but now they more so are, uh, or who well, sets these up? The actual uh, private, the private sector, or like the government? Yeah, it's it's it, it definitely varies from ISAC to ISAC, and so like as yeah. my boss says, if you've seen one ISAC, you've seen one ISAC. Um, they are very different from each other. The rules, Got the it. member um, principles change from one to another. And so I can, you know, just speaking from the financial services ISAC standpoint, where I spent many years, um, at one point, uh, probably in the uh, mid, uh, probably like 2007, 8, 9, 10, somewhere in that time frame, um, the rules did change to allow uh, government organizations to, be, to, to have some membership entitlements. So they didn't, they weren't basically seeing all the sensitive member sharing information but they right. were seeing some, some of the data that was there. And I think the real, real spirit of what was going on there was to allow the people that were protecting their networks. So just as an example, maybe the, the SOC at U.S. Treasury could belong. But the idea was just making sure that the regulators did not have access to that same information. So the whole idea was that you want a member that, that can, can confidently share sensitive information, especially when they're dealing with an incident. They want to be able to share that with their peers, but they don't want it going to a regulator who's going to potentially use that against them in an examination. That's, that's gotcha. generally okay. the idea. Yeah, because like when you were describing ISACs, what it sounded to me, it sounded like the FBI's InfraGuard program that started a couple, right. like a couple, what, a decade or two ago? No, a decade ago. Right. Um, and so I was kind of like, what's the difference between like InfraGuard and the, and like a bunch of these different places popping up, um, ISACs popping up, and uh, or well, is the like FBI. InfraGuard just another ISAC? You know, cat, cat. The, the the difference is it's the FBI saying this is our thing, stay out. We're only going to share yeah. this with people that are a part of the the club. You know, got it. Okay, gotcha. So the FBI is a the the InfraGuard is a public private partnership. Whereas the ISAC is a nonprofit, typically, that's run yeah. by and for the members of the uh, that critical infrastructure branch, and then there's the ISAOs, which are the membership organizations run very similarly. So yeah. it, it, Scott's yeah. absolutely right in that uh, in InfraGuard is the FBI owning it, in the uh, <laughs> in the ISACs it's the members owning it. Uh, Errol, yeah. have right. I misconstrued anything? No, that, that's perfect, and I, and I think that. Um, 
you know, it really depends on who you're comfortable sharing with. And that's really what it comes down to. And so in, in the ISAC case, and, and I can, again, I can speak from my experience at places like the financial ISAC, health, health ISAC, some of the others that I know as well. Um, the info sharing is very tightly controlled. There are, there are member to member sharing that can only stay within the membership. It's not allowed to be released publicly. And then there is, again, some, some level of trust that those organizations have uh, to ensure that it's going to the right people. And I think that, you know, that's one of the key differences that I would say with other organizations like InfraGuard um, or other info sharing groups that are out there. The ISALs are another great example that was created in 2015. Um, and again, I, I would also encourage people to, to seek those out and, and, and try to join one of those if you potentially don't qualify for an ISAC. So when dealing with ISACs, um, when dealing with ISACs, is this only to the U.S. or is this international as well? Do you have people from other governments that want to join in in the discussion uh, join you? Yeah, another great question. So I can tell you in 2003, the financial services ISAC shifted their strategy to, um, to, to get members from outside the U.S. to join as well. Uh, Health ISAC has been doing that also for the last few years. Uh, so our membership is international and, and, you know, we look at it, you know, I would say in a couple of different ways. One is, you know, when you look at who our members are, they are international organizations already, maybe based in the U S but we are also looking at expanding membership outside the U S as well, Europe, Asia, uh, et cetera. And, um, one of the interesting things when building on top of the question that we had before is one of the very unique things with healthcare, as you, as you may know, is a lot of health care in countries outside the U.S. is run by the government. They are state, state-sponsored health care plans. And so when you look at our membership, um, that was one of the, I'd say, key differences that we have where we have government organizations who are members or pieces of those government organizations that are members because ultimately they are the mm -hmm. ones that are delivering the health care. They're also delivering the IT behind it. So as being part of an ISAC, like the healthcare ISAC or the financial ISAC, what can somebody who is thinking about joining, what can they expect uh, as part of the delivery of being a member of that? So um, again, the services vary widely. And again, just looking at um, finance, uh, uh, retail and hospitality, health sector, IT, I know that all of those organizations have their own, um, essentially, uh, I, call, I call the health one, we call it a threat operations center. We have staff of, of threat analysts and cybersecurity, physical security analysts on board that are gathering threat intelligence information and pushing it out to our members in a consumable format. Um, so we publish information on that, uh, tactical information on a daily basis. We publish strategic reporting as well. And I know many of the other ISACs uh, do that as well. So there's, there's information that's being delivered. And then, and then there are vehicles to share um, automated threat indicators as well. So I know we've got a number of different mechanisms, systems in place today to gather automated indicator sharing from members who are willing to share that. And then again, distribute it out to the, to the rest of the membership with whatever way that they are set up to consume that information. But there's, there's other things. There's conferences, summits, regional meetings. There are uh, special interest groups, work groups, committees that are set up, you know, typical birds of a feather that get just getting people together that are dealing with a common problem and sharing best practices. So there's a, a lot of different services that fall under the ISAC today. Right. What's okay. The, so oh, with sorry, the InfraGuard, they have, they have a level set where they say you must be this tall to ride this ride. Does the ISAC have the same type of requirements for entry? Um, so again, they're, they're, they're all different. They all have different membership criteria. I can tell you again from the finance sector side, I know that the membership criteria had to do if you were a financial institution that was regulated by some regulatory body that was recognized by the group. That essentially was the bar for entry uh, in, the, in the health sector uh it's it i will i will simplify it by saying if you are an organization that 
handles sensitive patient information, you can probably qualify for membership. So I'd say, you know, one of the things that's pretty unique with, with healthcare is that not only is it hospitals, um, insurance companies, payment providers, uh, it also includes things like medical device manufacturers and electronic health records, software manufacturers, and things of that sort that fall into those categories. So it's pretty unique. So something I'm curious about, Errol, is um, uh, we tend to talk a lot on this show and also on our, our flagship show, Paul Security Weekly, about the maturity of security uh, groups within organizations, you know, the, 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 the general, uh, maturity of security in, in organizations. Uh, and we usually tip our hats to financial services, uh, having the most collectively mature security groups, uh, mostly because they've been doing it the longest, you know, from the earliest days, from when we were just getting started, uh, you know, the bad guys, uh, that weren't just, you know, defacing, you know, websites and stuff for fun or breaking into main, you know, university mainframes, you know, just for the bragging rights, uh, the ones that were trying to monetize, they, they went after the money. So, you know, from an early time, financial services of all types, were 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 the targets and invested early and in, and often in security. Um, I I I would assume, and I guess in the form of a question, has that helped the FSISAC, you know, sort of be you know be the leader and 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 I would and and also historically healthcare in our discussions, healthcare organizations tend to be lagging behind in terms of the maturity of their organizations. You know, how do how does how does your organization healthcare you know, Jeff, Isaac it, help or hurt? You're yeah. so, so rude. I mean, come on, man. Just because healthcare dumps records and, and, and medical information by the millions <laughs> in, in, in open, uncleared channels doesn't mean that they're not secure. They're securing what's important, and that's their insurance payouts. I didn't say PCI. secure. I said mature. <laughs> I'm feeling Let a little hard now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, so let's talk. Let's, let's break that down a little bit. So uh, definitely agree with you. The finance sector has been investing in security for a long time, and there's, there's a clear line of benefit there, right? Protect, let protect the house, or we're going to lose some money. And, uh, and and so that's been happening for a long time, and a clear motivation on why they needed to invest in security. The other one, Jeff, that comes to mind from the beginning is going to be defense, right? The defense industrial base; those organizations sure. are certainly spending plenty of money on defending their infrastructure as well. Um, uh, I'm going to disagree with you there, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can. You were yeah, in, I you were in diapers back about then, that. Josh. Come on. So, so the one Only other thing you paid that extra helped out, the one thing that helped out the finance sector also was that the regulators in the U.S. definitely recommended to their organizations that were under their um, um, scrutiny that they should belong to the financial services ISAC. And when that happened, the, the former uh, head of FS ISAC, Bill Nelson, had said that the membership tsunami began at that point. He, they just had a, literally a, a, a huge spike in membership as a result of the regulator encouraging membership in the ISAC. So that helped big time back then. Um, healthcare, yeah, definitely. Uh, there's plenty of room to grow from an investment standpoint. Uh, I mentioned earlier some of the different subsectors that we see within healthcare. So um, big pharma, insurance, the payment uh, side of the organization, I would say very similar investment infrastructure that I've seen in financial services. They have phenomenal security teams and they're spending plenty on security. Um, they, I think they're doing a really great job there. There is plenty of room to go on the other end of the spectrum when we start looking at uh, health delivery organizations, hospitals. There are plenty of hospitals that, that have incredible security teams and they've got, they've got uh, money that they're spending on security. But we're reading about plenty of other hospitals in the news today that are getting bit by ransomware and other problems and leaking um, sensitive patient information, as Josh, as you talked about. 
it's happening. Uh, you just go and spend five minutes perusing HHS's, uh, I call it the wall of shame, you know, the breach report that's out there. It's public information. And you can see all of the data breaches that have happened in the health sector within the last, I think, 10 years worth of data that's there. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, you know, the heart of my question is, Errol, you've spent your career in financial services. Why did you jump to health? Uh, you know, knowing you the way I do, I'm thinking you kind of, you took it as the, you know, the, the last and greatest challenge in the twilight of our careers. But uh, I, I, I sometimes think, wow, that must be just a, it must be really night and day sometimes, uh, you know, given what you came out of and, and what you're encountering, maybe in terms of the maturity, maybe in terms of attention, budget. Uh, I, I, um, I, I'm sure there's not a, a dull moment in, in your current endeavors. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of work to do. But I will tell you, Jeff, that, you know, I think the thing that I really was attracted to the job about was the challenge, right? We know that there is not enough security spending generally across the health s s sector. So mm -hmm. one of the challenges for me was, you know, what could I do to help improve security in the sector that maybe does not have the resources yet dedicated to cybersecurity or resilience or physical security for that matter? What could I do to help? And, and that, that was a big part of the challenge. The other part of it was really from, a, from the standpoint of helping to really frame what it is we were going to do from a delivery standpoint on threat intelligence and member facing services that we were going to offer to the sector. And it was, it was really neat for me to, to jump into that, to help define what that was coming from what I did originally to help field the FSI SAC, you know, 20 plus years ago. And then my time as um, a threat intelligence uh, professional at, at places like Citibank and Bank of America, consuming ISAC services, and then making the jump to healthcare to try to figure out, okay, what really worked? How can I best spend you know, my money um, virtually, let's say, as putting myself in the shoes of a member? How would I do that um, in healthcare? And, and really, what could I do to help the sector out? So that, those were the big things for me. Okay. A blast. This is, right. And a this lot, is, of, a uh, lot of, I'm sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, this is probably a good time to uh, to take a quick break. Scott, if you can hold your question, I'll, I'll, I'll let oh, you go oh, first. Oh, I, I, I totally can. I want to talk about financial availability inside of healthcare organizations, because that's, that's a big Certainly. one. We've got a lot more to talk about, so let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back. 